Welcome to the latest in the interview series on Back of the Net. And on the show today, we're very pleased to be joined by two AFC Bournemouth players from the early 80s. Firstly, we have a familiar face on the pod, by the way, of Tony Funnel. Tony played for Bournemouth, Gillingham, Brentford and Southampton, as well as managing locally with Hamworthy United and Paul Town. He played two seasons for the Cherries in 1981 and finished top scorer in his first season, helping the Cherries clinch promotion. How are you, Tony? Very well, yeah, very well. Excellent. And with Tony, we have the midfielder, uh, the original hard man of the AFC Bournemouth team, who played in the same side as Tony and went on to notch up 102 appearances for the Cherries, leaving in 1987. As well as, this, as well as this, he also had a long spell at Northampton Town, as well as a couple of seasons at Aston Villa. It's Keith Williams. Welcome, Keith. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks, Jeff. Good to have you. And it's fantastic to have you both on. And once again, we're also joined by Neil Dawson for a trip down memory lane. Neil, you all right? Yeah, no, very good. Looking forward to it. Good stuff. Good stuff. So let's go straight in. Uh, Tony first, how did your football career actually start all those years ago? I started at uh, Eastbourne United and then um, I had a trial at Southampton and uh, they said no. But the scout who recommended me, uh, he'd only just joined Southampton as a scout and he said, would you send someone else and have a look at the lad? And someone else came down, watched me. I was down there for a week or so and then I signed with Southampton. And Keith, what about you? Where did it all begin for you? I started at Aston Villa, um, 1973, when I was 16, just left school. And uh, I was at Villa for about three and a half years with about with several great players from them days, Andy Gray, play, people like that, Dennis Mortimer. So, yeah, I was there for about three and a half years at Villa. Didn't quite make the first team there, though, and went on to move to uh, Northampton in 1977. You both arrived at the same time, really, to, to AFC Bournemouth, um, and for one of the most fondly remembered seasons for fans of a certain vintage. What were your first opinions of both the club and the squad uh, when you arrived? Uh, I'll go first. Yeah, I, um, I was impressed with the squad. We had some really good players. Um and a lot of the players had played for um, bigger clubs as well. Keith had been at um, Aston Villa. Uh, Tommy Heffernan, he was at Tottenham. Myself and Kevin Daughtry, we both come from Southampton. Uh, we had Phil Brignall, West Ham United. Chris Sully, he started at Chelsea. So we had some really good players. We was, it was, we was a tidy side. What about you, Keith? What, what did you think? Well, I came from when I left Northampton. I think we'd played Bournemouth a few games before the end of that, that previous season. And um, I came down for a trial at uh, Bournemouth and I got signed on uh, by Webby. But um, it was, uh, there were players I didn't really know too much about, to be honest. You know, your Nigel Spatmans and all this, Phil Brignall, Tony probably knows more than me. But um, they were decent players. They were they were decent. So uh, it, it was a decent squad that uh, Webby and Harry are putting together. Talking about David Webb, I mean, he was a, a fascinating character. He had all sorts of involvements, and he was outside of football, car dealerships, etc. What was he like to What was he like to play for? I thought he was brilliant. Yeah, I, I love playing both for um, Dave and Harry. Um, they were really good couple of guys they knew the game inside out um our training was good fun really enjoyed the training and but also i think not just like da um dave and harry but the whole team in that sort of season we just bonded well together as a whole team do you agree with that keith yeah loved them both right two do totally different characters webby was well, well, I would say, you, you look at him, he's hard nails. Where, you know, you wouldn't want an argument with him. Um, Harry was his fall guy in them days, uh, young, uh, just finishing his career more than anything. But uh, they knew their football. Going into that season, 
uh, that 81 82 season i mean i i remember thinking that the the squad could achieve something in division 4 it felt like there was a, a great deal of quality in the side were were those your impressions did you have a have a lot of hope for a promotion that season Keith might be better to start this off because uh, Keith was there at yeah, the start I of the season, say. I think. I didn't come mm. till probably end of September. Yeah, I started, we started, yeah. I started before, you know, Tony came a bit later because we had uh, Trevor Morgan and Dean Mooney playing up front at the time. Uh, I think Tony came later uh, after Dino broke his leg. Um, but, yeah, we started fantastic. I think we were unbeaten for probably the first eight or nine games, I think, and and really sort of showing some great signs and potential of possible going up, uh, having a possible promotion. What was the style of play like? Because, I mean, I remember I was very young, I'll be honest. I'll, 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 I'll hold my hands up and say that. But I remember, I remember um, it, the side was built on a, on a great defence. I don't think we conceded more than two goals in any game in that season. What, what was the style of play that um, David and Harry were trying to get into the team? <laughs> Before Tony came, I mean the training and that they had us playing from the back. Uh, uh, you know, in, in a lot of the training sessions, they wanted us to play, to play for how a football man anyway. Um, but Webby surprised me with the amount of football he wanted us to play. So yeah, there was, there was we played a lot of uh, football um, in training to go out into the games, and that's how we started. And, and to be honest, we started really well. Yeah, I can remember. Um... Every week, we used to just play pattern of play, pattern of play. As a striker, up front, I got a bit fed up of it, but it did so much. <laughs> no, it did. It was, did so much for the defence and the midfield because they all knew what they were doing. And, you know, that proved we had you know, a back four that was really well organised and our midfield was well organised. And, well, we were sharp up front because we actually we did sign um, Andy Crawford, I think uh, I came in September. I think he made a come in about December time. And he could play Andy Crawford. Yeah, he was great. He had a great left foot, I think, didn't he, as I remember. And and you were both, you know, very similar stature players, weren't you? Because we were unusual in Division 4 to be playing with you and Andy Crawford up front. I know Trevor Morgan was a, a big sort of target man type player, but when it was you... Crawford and Steve Carter on the wing. I mean, we must have been the smallest attacking lineup of any team in that division, weren't we? We were small, but we were quick. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what you said make me laugh. Keith would probably agree with this. Andy Crawford was different class. He, a boy could play. He had so much ability. But I get so frustrated. I'd be up front and we'd be playing in the game and he'd go past one player and he'd go past two and three players and I thought, Andy, different class. <laughs> and here I am. You've just got now, you've got one more defender to beat or possibly the goalkeeper, but just give it to me. There's another goal for me. Team, of, we've gone one nil up or we've gone two nil up. What would Andy do? He'd take on the last defender <laughs> or the goalkeeper and lose it. He was so frustrated. <laughs> I always thought with that, I mean, Andy Crawford and Steve Carter seemed players to me that were playing at a level below where they should. But I guess when you look back, they were, you probably got one great game in three from them, didn't you? They weren't, they didn't, they didn't produce it week after week. Because Steve Carter, to me, used to look like a player who should be at a much higher level. Was that, is that how you remember it? I, personally, I loved Steve Carter. As a striker, all you wanted to do was know that balls were going to be delivered in the box when you wanted them. And, and I knew that if I made the correct runs off the defenders, if Steve Carter got half a yard, that's all he needed. And he whipped the ball just where you wanted it. I thought he was a very good player. Yeah. The other key man that season, I thought, was uh, Nigel Spackman, who I remember the previous season thinking... What is this kid? Why is he getting so much game time? Because he's absolutely atrocious. And I reckon the pre-season, Keith, you taught him how to tackle because he came out in that season, 81-82, as a totally different player and never looked back. I, I, I don't think I taught him how to tackle, Jeff. That's for sure. But, all right, uh, he was... Nigel was a young lad. He was... He was. I don't know if he was two or three years younger than me. I'm not so sure. But... Um, the one thing Nigel had, he had such an engine on him. Uh, one of the fittest blokes at the club. 
his passing wasn't the best. That's for sure. He wasn't he wasn't consistent with that. But I I don't think I've ever seen such an improvement in a player in a in a season in one season alone. He was phenomenal as as the season went on. He got better and better. And it doesn't matter what you say about Nigel, the clubs he went to afterwards, after he left Bournemouth, were mm. just phenomenal. So fair play to the lad. Um, he must have worked, and I'm sure he did, he worked hard on his game. But he did the simple things, Nigel. He he, he ran his socks off for the club. Uh, but when he won the ball, he passed it to somebody who could play. And, and that was his job. And that was his job through the whole of his career, I thought. And he did it really well. Mm. He did. Uh, we get, moving from a player who was uh, a youngster that did really well, I think uh, something that might be really interesting to talk about, two old-timers that came and joined. Firstly, Charlie George. And then secondly, you must have been absolutely amazed the year after when you were both stood in training and David uh, Harry Redknapp said, meet our new winger and George Best was stood there. What was it like <laughs> playing with those two? I remember um, Charlie George because I knew him from Southampton. He came to Southampton when I was there, and, and he was a great guy. And um, I found it brilliant playing with Charlie George. But when um, Bestie come, that was an exciting time. But I got a feeling I was injured. I don't think I played a lot of times there. I think um, Keithy had more to do with uh, George Best. Keith? Well, yeah. The only time, well, the things I had to do with George Best was pick him up, take him to training. Take him to the airport, things like that. <laughs> no, I checked. Neither of you actually played with George Best, did you? In a game, um, I look back on the records. I think you, I think you were on the. Uh, you came in for him when he didn't make a couple of games, Keith, didn't you? Yeah, possibly. Um, it's, it's so long back now. I don't think I had the pleasure of playing with George. No, but I had the pleasure of of taking him to training on many occasions and also picking him up or taking him to airports and picking him up from airports with another young lady on his arm. So, yeah, George George was <laughs> George was a one-off. I'll tell you what, he was one of the nicest guys, quietest guys you'd ever meet. Honestly, he was he wouldn't say he wouldn't say much in the dressing room. Um got on with his training, got on with doing what he needed to do. Uh so yeah, I saw the better side of of George or, or we did, I think, at times. And Charlie George, as I remember, Tony, um, that he only played a couple of games, but I'm pretty certain he, he assisted one of your goals in, in one of the two games that he played. Am I am I remembering things badly there? Sounds good if I scored a goal. Yeah, I'm happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie was brilliant. He had so much skill. Great pass for a ball. He was only with us for two games, wasn't he, though? Didn't he? Why was that such a short spell? I don't know. I haven't got a clue. No, I don't know about that. There were a few that came in for bits and bobs because Eddie Kelly did for a little while and Ivan Golak. It was like we were we were a retirement home for a few for a few years, weren't we? A few people coming in for a, a little soiree. Well, Eddie might have come for a little soiree, but he could play as well. He could, yeah. He was another really nice lad, done a lot in the game, but he wasn't flash or anything. Everyone we got, Ivan Golak is was a great lad. I knew him at Southampton. Mm -hmm. Uh, Charlie George, great lad, George Best, Eddie Kelly. You know, Dave and Harry did get the right players to come along, even though they've only played little bit parts. And it also extended that celebrity vibe to the directors because that was the year when you were playing that we had Jim Davidson as uh, as a director of the club. How on earth did Jim Davidson get involved? i got no idea. <laughs> I don't know whether Tony has any idea, but i got no idea. It, he was, it, I, think, uh, it, it, <laughs> I think he was obviously friends with Dave Webb. I'm sure of that. Yeah. And, and but he was he was a great guy to all the the players. Everyone loved him. Yeah. There is a fantastic bit of footage on YouTube of uh, of uh, uh, sport on uh, Southern at the time. Maybe it was Meridian. I can't remember. But anyway, uh, and they film the Hereford game, the last game of the season. As an interview, Fred Dynage talking to Jim Davidson for match analysis, and it's hilarious. To get that equaliser. Yeah, super. I feel very sorry for Ian Lee. That's such a great season. His first time on television, he makes the only mistake I've seen him made. I swear that, as, I swear as true as I'm sitting on this bicycle. <laughs> uh, I've seen that, yeah. I have seen that, yeah. 
Dragging it back to football for a bit, the the top teams in those uh, in that division at the time, Sheffield United, Bradford City, there were some great games, weren't there, against the those two big teams? What do you remember about them? Start with Keith. Yeah, the Sheffield United games, a couple of great games. I think we drew nil nil at home in the first game when they come to our place. Hard to be tough, um, but we always did well. We always did well against the top teams. Um, away from home, the second leg, I don't think I played. I think I was suspended. And I think Brian O'Donnell played on that day. So, uh, but Sheffield United and Bradford, a uh, couple of my, I think Bobby Campbell played for Bradford at the time as well, who was with me at Aston Villa as an apprentice. Uh, he was a handful as well. What are your yeah, memories, uh, Tony? Well, Keith's saying he was uh, suspended. Why he was suspended, I'd never know. The <laughs> lad never made a tackle. I mean, I was so, as a player, I was aggressive. I used to dive in the tackles here, there and everywhere. Keith, a little bit. No, he didn't fancy this. He didn't fancy that. Oh. No, I remember the um, the Bradford game, to be honest, because I think we, we drew up there. It was a big game. It was on telly. I'm sure it was on telly. And uh, I remember getting the ball played just outside the box and I could have part. Actually, I could have passed it to Andy Crawford. I must have thought, well, how many times have you never passed to me? So I'm going to give you the ball this time. <laughs> so I made myself an angle, got a shot in, and the keeper saved it easy. It was a poor shot by me. They went up the other end and scored a goal. And I think they made it two. It possibly made it two two. We would have won the game. And where he was livid. We had, we had <laughs> 10 players behind me, but it was my fault because I shot. Uh, yeah, he didn't speak to me on the coach afterwards. He was a nightmare. And I, I remember going up to him as we walked off the coach and said, Dave, I know that went wrong, but think of all the goals I did score for you this season. <laughs> and he did smile. He gave me a chuckle then. I mean, I, th I thought he was a great manager too. He got the team playing in a really positive way and a refreshing way for for Bournemouth fans. I mean, we we were winning games. We we drew quite a lot of games, but we didn't lose many, as as Neil said earlier. Why why do you think that uh, that Webby didn't go on to be a successful manager elsewhere, like Harry did? I don't know. I, th I think he was successful in his own way. You know, he, he managed a, a few clubs, and he was he didn't do too bad, but. Perhaps Harry just learned everything he did off of uh, Dave. And then that's the reason. They were both different classes, managers. You know, loved them both. You know, but it worked with Harry on many occasions. And unfortunately, it didn't work with Dave. Could you see in Harry Redknapp um, some sort of like just genius in coaching or ability with players that you could, could you see at that early age for him that he would go on and manage top six clubs in, in the Premier League? Uh, I must admit, I always enjoy the training, but I don't think I envisaged that he'd go on and do that. And um, I mean, to be honest, he'd done brilliant. And I, I used to love watching his sides play. Yeah, they, play, they always played the right football. And you know, going back to the Bournemouth days, we had a, a great back four and a great midfield. We were so strong, tight, organised, but we weren't boring. We tried to open up and play as well. It was just when we lost the ball, we knew what we, well. I say we know what he's doing. I'm saying we. I, I was never <laughs> at the back very much, but the, the back four and the defence knew what they were doing. And Tony, what was your favourite goal? Because you were top scorer that season with 16. So which ones do you remember best of all? That's, uh, oh. I'll tell you the one I remember. Hartlepool at home. I think we beat them 5-1. And you picked up the ball. You spanned the centre half on the halfway line and ran the whole half and slotted it in. And I just thought... That's Tony Funnel in a nutshell. Low centre of gravity, quick, quick turn, and and just uh, excellent finish. That's what I remember. Probably most people would say that's unusual for Tony. He's never that far out. <laughs> <the six -yard laughs> I was always getting nipping in in the six yard box and scoring. Keith, we talked. Uh, Keith, we talked about Tony's favourite goal. What was your favourite tackle? <laughs> I I got no idea. I I, I made so many in my time, um, but it was just look. It was part of my game. My favourite one of yours, Keith, was on being in the new stand on the halfway line on a wet night, a Tuesday night, and I saw you coming from the centre spot 
sliding in to take out their winger and you put him into the stand right in front of me. <laughs> it was fantastic. Yeah, it must be but so I loved great. seeing that. See, I read where the ball was going a lot of the time, but it was, I just loved, I loved to tackle. It was just, it was, I've loved it since I was a little one and I carried it on through my career. So uh, um, it was just part of my game. Um, I wasn't the best pass for the ball, but I could work hard and uh, I, I could tackle, that's for sure. And do you want to talk us through your one goal, your penalty against York City? <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you the one I missed when Webby gave me a right rollicking. <laughs> because I was the penalty taker to start with. And I think I missed the penalty against Northampton, which uh, at the start of the season, which broke our um, our uh, record of, of staying unbeaten. Uh, we lost 1-0 at Northampton, but I missed a penalty that day. And Mr. Webb sort of um, had a few words to say to me after, at the end of the game. So I, I wasn't on the penalties again after that. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll, blow, I'll blow your trumpet for you, Keith, because I remember you scoring oh, a couple. I remember you scoring a couple of absolute bangers um, in the cup. I think yeah. one was one was against Dorchester, and I think this is to make me sound like a right nerd, but I think you scored one in the whatever the associate members' cup was called those days. I think you put one in the top corner in a in a heavy win against. It might have been older shot. I can't remember, but I remember you scoring a couple of bangers. I remember you scoring as well. Yeah, I'll... in the um, in the Dorchester one, we played Dorchester away first. And uh, they played well, actually. And um, I remember, I think either uh, I scored and uh, I obviously got a bit excited and went celebrating to the crowd and the um, all the hoardings come down, the crowd come on the pitch. And uh, I got a feeling that uh, Andy Crawford might have missed a penalty in that game. We finished up 1-1. And then we went to back to Bournemouth to play Dorchester. And uh, Keith, who said he could tackle, but he couldn't play that well, Keith got a screamer. Yeah. Yeah, that was a 2 1 win, that one, wasn't it? They had Trevor Senior up front, as I remember. Yeah, he got a screamer that day. Uh, Trevor Senior was, was being toted by a few clubs at that time, I think. Uh, decent player, Trevor. Good, good centre forward. But the goal I scored, I think, it was a volley from the edge of the box. Yeah, and I'm I'm not sure whether it was an extra time or it was a, it was definitely in the last few minutes of the game, if not extra time. But um, uh, Dorchester was a uh, half decent team. I think Keith Keith Miller was running the side at the time, so he had a decent squad there. But yeah, not many goals, but just the one. <laughs> at least I scored in the FA Cup. That's that's I've Sorry. told my children that anyway. Certainly something. Uh, there was a really uh, big win as they, again in the FA Cup against Reading, who I think were in the division above and running away with the division at that time. And Tony, I think you scored the winner in that one, which which I, I felt at the time could have... It was only an FA Cup first round game, but it sort of said to me that the team were ready for promotion because you played unbelievably well that game. Yeah, I, I think in quite a lot of the games that season, we played really well. We, we was a good side. There's no getting away from it. But I think... One thing that we had in our favour also during that season, we didn't get many injuries. I don't think our team changed too much throughout that season, and, and that's so important. What were the, the two kind of main games that um, might be interesting to reflect on, which were the games where we won, uh, where we knew we were going up in the final game of the season? What do you remember of those? I think we won, did we win promotion at Bradford? And then the final game was Hereford, I think, wasn't it? How, how do you remember those, and what were the celebrations like after? I've got a feeling, if you check, we actually drew about three, either three of the last four games. So we we should, well, really, we should have won the league, I think, to be honest. But, um, yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed the Hereford game because we knew we was up. We had a big crowd, you know. Um, my son was born the night before. And uh, the story goes that I was awake all night, but I wasn't awake all night. <laughs> my, my wife gave birth at 12 o'clock and then I had a good night's sleep Then went to the game and scored a goal. So it wasn't like it was, it was portrayed. It was a, a famous Tony Funnel header from about a yard out, wasn't it? Six-yard box again. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't very much out that side that six-yard box. What do you remember, Keith? And, and did, did the team uh, paint the town red that night? 
Uh, no, we didn't actually. Because <laughs> that, that, that Bradford game was the game we won promotion. And uh, Webby was livid with Mr. Funnel, right? As he's already pointed out, all right, for us conceding that goal in the last minute. Bobby Campbell got the goal. Well, in fact, he scored both goals. But it was 2 1 up in injury time. That's why Webby was so livid. And like Tony says, we drew the last three games and he was adamant we were going to win the league. And he was furious with us. And no, we didn't, <laughs> we didn't paint the town red at all. We got on the coach and straight back to Bournemouth. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a happy scene, to be honest. <laughs> it, was better, it was better on the, um, the Hereford game. We did paint the town that night. The Hereford game, you did, yeah, Tony, yes. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> and I've seen clippings, to be fair, I've seen clippings of both games, of the Bradford game um, and uh, and the Hereford game on YouTube. So it's it's nice to look back on that because in our days, we didn't have too much, did we, really? No, and you um, you never blamed me for that goal. You actually said there was plenty of defenders back there. <laughs> <laughs> Webby was Webby was unhappy because he probably had a bet on us winning the league. <laughs> the following season was a uh, more of a transitional year. Obviously, you're up a league. We lost, uh, so David Webb uh, moved on. Harry Redknapp came in. Uh, famously, uh, there was the nil nine defeat at Lincoln. I checked back. Neither of you played in that. Um, so, a couple of questions: What was training like uh, after you've lost nine nil? And uh, do you think had either of you played the score would have been any different? I think we were both um, out because we've injured our backs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we both, unfortunately, got bad back injuries. And uh, I do remember the game, and obviously I couldn't believe the result. But it was after that, I think the following week, we played um, Sheffield United away. And uh, uh, Was it Brentford? No, no, we were late in Orient. Late in Orient. We lost oh, five we, one as well. So I don't think either of us played in <laughs> either of those two defeats, but I remember playing against Sheffield United the following game and we got a result up there. We drew with them. It was a great result. Obviously, if you start drawing and winning, you'll see you're both playing in those games, right? Oh, you're not going to admit to being as the nine deal at the five nil defeat. True. No, yeah, no. If you check the records, <laughs> we, we we didn't play, but um I, I do remember that coming up to the Sheffield United game after those bad defeats that uh, Harry asked us, you know, he needed us to play, he wanted us to play. And uh, I do remember after the Sheffield game, we say we got a good result up there. And uh, I was a bit downbeat after the game. And I remember him coming up to me and saying, no, we got a great result. You've done well. Why are you so downbeat? And my back was killing me. I, you know, I was injured. But I played that game because in those days we was having uh, cortisone injections. And uh, so I remember playing. Um, what about you, Keith? I mean, you were, you were as we've talked about, a the, bit of um, a hard man of your era. Um, do, do you think that's gone out of the game much too much these days? Or, and, and if so, who, was the, who do you think from your era was the hardest player that you played against? Um, yeah, the, the, the game's definitely changed since our day. Um, there's no way. I, I, I wouldn't last 90 minutes on a football pitch nowadays. You'd, you'd have to change the whole of your game to play now. Um, staying on your feet wasn't, wasn't in my game at all. So, <laughs> uh, and to be honest, I'm not sure I'd have enjoyed it so much. You, you would have adapted, obviously, but I just love to tackle. And the hardest player I had to play against, for sure, was um, Terry Herlock. I think Terry, I don't know whether Tony knew him. He was at Brentford at some point and Southampton. And Southampton, yeah. All right. Uh, he was a big, big boy, you know, big bloke. Yeah, he, he was um, He was tough, him. D didn't like me, you know. I mixed it with him a few times in my career. Yeah. And uh, I think Cammy was at um, Brentford as well at one point. I don't know whether Tony was there when Cammy was there. No, no. I remember um, Terry. Terry came from uh, non-league in London and uh, he was strong, such a strong player, great tackler. 
and could pass the ball. He, he did the same as Nigel Spatton and went on and played some good teams. But I always remember when uh, years ago, <coughs> shouldn't say this really, I suppose, but hey ho, we um, used to catch the undergrounds to get to the training. And uh, I never bought a ticket one end, I always bought the ticket at the far end. But if it wasn't a train guard, I didn't have to buy the ticket. And the amount of times I got stopped during the season, and have you got a ticket? No. You've got to pay for your ticket. Whenever I met Terry Herlock up on the underground, me and Terry Herlock was on the underground, and we come through Ostley where we used to train for Brentford. Same train guards. Every time I walked along with Terry, no one even said nothing. Because he, he was a big stocky lad. You wouldn't mess around with him. He saved me a fortune. <laughs> underground tickets, Terry. <laughs> Every team had a every team had a player like that, didn't they? In those days, I remember Mickey Tate was another one at Portsmouth. That was a he was a he was a hard player, wasn't he? He ended, uh, I think, Bobby Savage is not ended his career, but he hurt him badly and he never really recovered. There was a, there was a few players around, wasn't there? Every side had one player like that. Yeah, they were good job. I was quick because I didn't get caught by too many of them. But yeah, the game was uh, had loads. You, you had to have a good strong man. That was part of the game in those days. Mm. Um, it's just it's sort of in the the seasons now. I and mean, when you look back at I said, who's uh, Arsenal Vieira, someone just brushes him and he's falling over. Mm. It, in our day, it didn't happen. You never went down for penalties. If someone kicked you, you wanted to stand up. You wanted to score a goal. You didn't want to go down for a penalty. Mm. Yeah, times have changed, but times have changed for the good as well. I think yeah. Neil's Neil's got a question for you, Keith, about uh, what what would happen with you and Tony Pulis in a confrontation. Do you want to ask that, Neil? Yeah, no, I was I was, I was thinking because obviously you were in the same squad for a little while, uh, you and Tony Pulis. I just wondered if the, in training, if the ball landed in a fifty-fifty between the two of you, who'd come out on top? Well, it, it would obviously be me, wouldn't it? You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Tony was slower than me. I think Harry's got in his book that Tony hammered me in training. Yeah. Um, and but you know, I can never remember that time at all. But I was more, I like to get around the pitch a lot more. Tony more or less paraded around the center of that pitch. But to be fair to Tony, a lot of clubs had them sort of players in them days. It's more ball players now. Um, but you know, nearly every club had one in. in and Keith, in the eighty five eighty six season, um, you you came back quite late into that season, but uh, your return coincided with I think it was fifteen points in seven games that that kept us up, and we had a certain Colin Clark in the side. What do you remember about Colin as a goal scorer? Because he was a he was a bit of a phenomenon that one season for us, wasn't he? Great player, Colin. He was he was decent, and um, Harry took a chance on him, uh, but he knows his players. Harry, he has done all his all his career, and I think that's why he's picked up so many good ones. Uh, he, 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 people said, you know, some of them said not so sure about Colin, but he, he, he stuck his neck out and, and bought him, and uh, he didn't look back at it. I think 30 odd goals, I think it was. The following season, as well, Keith, it, it was obviously the promotion season, the 86 87 season. You were, I think, doing a bit of coaching with the side by then, uh, as because injuries were getting quite a lot for you, but. I think it's it's often forgotten that you actually came back and you played five games in that season when Tony Pulis got injured uh, and we picked up 10 crucial points. What what was it like to play in that team? Must have been quite special. Yeah, no, great. Great to play. Love getting back into it. And um and bless him Tony Seely who came in, he offered me his champion his his winner's medal which I refused. Yeah, but um, yeah, good good players in them days. Your Trevor Aylots, people like that, good players. Tony, what about you? Because your career kind of ended after that '83 season, didn't it for for us? And what why did it why did it end prematurely for you at, at the Cherries? It was me back. I had a back injury and um, just went for loads of different uh, treatments, and it didn't work. And uh, my contract was up. And uh, I think I had a year out of the game and didn't play. And then um, Paul Town come and asked if I'd have a game. And then um, I joined Paul Town and just playing part-time. 
not training, I never look back. So I, I remember uh, I live in Pool, uh, so I used to go down Pool Town where uh, Bournemouth were uh, away uh, a lot of times. I used to. It might just be that, you know, I'm not a massive expert on football, but I used to look at you then and think you could still play league football because you scored so many goals and you looked very mobile. Was it, do you think you could have played, played, gone back and played league football or was non-league really the more comfortable level for your body? No, I think, I, I did think I could get, you know, go back and play again. I, um, I think there was one season where I think I scored 40-odd goals for Paul. Hmm. And it was expected that I'd go back to Bournemouth. But I've got a feeling that there must have been something to do with the ins maybe some insurance money that was taken yeah. on me not playing. And that would have had to have been paid back if I came back professional football again. And unfortunately, it never happened. But never mind. And how, how are you now, Tony? Because you, you, you played for a number of years, didn't you? And then you, 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 sort of, you did some stuff with Hanworthy as well, didn't you? So are you still connected to the club in any way, apart from being on the podcast now and again with your amazingly uh, accurate forecasts? <laughs> um, no, I, uh, up until the last um, season or so, I was working with... Um, the press association doing the stats at the games at Southampton. Uh, but this past season, I've stopped doing that now. So now it's just, you know, I watch Southampton, I watch Bournemouth, enjoy watching both the teams play and uh, concentrate on my golf. Keith, do you get along to watch Bournemouth still or what's your football involvement these days? No, I've, I've been to a couple of games, uh, two or three games over the years, uh, but it's so hard to get tickets now, uh, even for ex-players. Uh, we've got one final question. Obviously, we had Willow and Mozza on the, on the podcast last week and uh, there were a few legendary stories. So, Neil, I'm going to hand this one over to you because you, you actually seem to bump into most of that team on, on nights out in the town. Yeah, no, just uh, who were the biggest characters uh, in the side when you were playing in terms of uh, enjoying a drink and a night out? Any funny stories? Uh, no funny stories that I can think of, but uh, I think our main lad was Tommy Heffernan. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say Tommy. He, he was, yeah, Tommy Heffernan. What a character he was. And and the thing is, and which is the nicest thing, I've we had the 86-87 reunion uh back a few years ago didn't we mm -hmm. that was it three years ago maybe uh at um at the swansea game at bournemouth all right i hadn't seen tommy for 30 years so i'd lost touch with him i hadn't spoken to him for 30 years so yeah he was a character tommy he would come training in a in a bin bag oh, but, uh, there's nothing to say about that is there <laughs> <laughs> He was a great character, and he scored. He scored some. He scored some fantastic goals for a fullback as well. He used to bomb up and down that pitch, and he? he was fantastic. I think we all love watching Tommy Heffernan when we were that age. We all love Tommy. We all love Tommy. I think. I think also, um, you know, just just what a great what a great season that was. Because I I, I've, I always felt that that season set us on an upward path. I mean, I know we had some tough times in the nineties, but but it felt that that team. Um, was followed by the the game against Manchester United, which obviously was a big defining moment in '84. Don't, were you were you playing in that one, Keith, or did you miss that one too? I, I played in the two. It was the milk played in that one, but I was injured for the. Um, I got injured. Uh, there's a fellow called Ray Train um, who had been on loan, and that was his last game against Man United. And Harry did tell me I was playing uh, against Man United during the week. Unfortunately, while I was training, Mozzie took a shot and took my ankle back. And uh, I ended up being injured and Ray trained. So, yeah, I missed my opportunity against Man United in that 2-0. Uh, so, yeah, uh, some some memories there. Some memories there. Fantastic. Well, look, it's been great having you both on. Tony, I just thought you'd like to know that your funnel forecast videos have gone down incredibly well. We're, we're actually racking up over 5,000 views for them so far. And I don't think any of them are Paddy Power checking that they're losing money, by the way. Oh, um, right. Oh, that's good. But anyway, uh, what, what are your views on the predicting how the season's going to play out this year? Oh, so difficult. I, I just think that it's going to end up 
where it, the games are replayed on neutral grounds. Uh, and if that's the case, I don't think you can relegate any teams. The teams from the championship can get promoted and then the following season and maybe the season after that, the next two seasons, more teams will go down than normal. But I don't think it's fair to relegate anyone, especially you know, if, you, if you end up with, you've got three or four good chance home games to finish off the league. And now you're not going to get them. You've got to play neutral grounds. I don't think it'd be fair for the bottom clubs. What do you think, Keith? Something's got to be done. And I'm with Tony. Uh, no relegation, but promotion from other sides. And then more, more teams go down. I think that's, that would be the best uh, scenario for everybody, I think. Seems sensible to me. What do you think, Neil? Uh, well, I think, unfortunately, the league have said that they have to honour um, the agreement to have relegation, haven't they? So I think they've come out and said that in the last two days. Uh, I think if the season can be finished, then there should be relegation. Um, I think it is going to be unfair whoever goes down. But I think we're living in a society and a life at the moment where things are unfair for an awful lot of people. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so we'll, we'll have to wait and see what happens, but I think there will be relegation, but if we get the games back on, I think we've got enough to stay up. I'd agree with that. Well, fingers crossed that, uh, that we do stay up. Gents, it's been brilliant talking with you. Neil, thanks again for your input as well. And I gather, Neil, you're joining us on Sunday night for our next live show, which, uh, I know we're, we're both very much looking forward to. Um, yeah. so everyone watching, make sure you tune in for that one. Uh, and please remember to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. It means a lot to us and uh, we're very grateful for your support. We're going to try and keep going with this content as, uh, as, much, as much as we possibly can. We've got another trip down memory lane in the 80s for, uh, for you next week. So stay tuned for that too. Uh, look forward to seeing you on the next video.